All right, good morning. So in the first service, Pastor Eric, he's probably hiding around the corner. We're going to rat him out. He, uh, he told everyone, everyone in the first service that during the message, just go ahead and fill out your application. Or, you know, enter the thing online and just while, while Dan's talking, just go ahead and fill out the app stuff and all this other stuff. So I came out and just told him, hey, wait a minute, it's his idea at the end of the service, he's going to come out and sing. Don't stand, don't sing. That's when you could fill out the application when it's on his time, not on my time, all right? No, I'm just kidding. It's all good. So, uh, hey, inside your program is a Be Rich uh, outline. Just kind of let me briefly share with you, if you haven't been here, this is our third year doing it. And the idea behind it uh, when we started several years ago was simply this, to find an organization, this year we have two, but to find an organization that's doing something great in the community and just to come alongside of them during this four-week season and bless them financially and to also, if there's an opportunity for us to serve in both of these cases uh, we'll have opportunities to serve, just to come alongside of them and help them. We, we don't want to compete with them. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. They're doing a great job, and we just want to come alongside for this season and do that. If you've been in our church for any length of time, we don't do a lot of fundraiser stuff. In fact, we don't do any. Um, we just do this one time a year, and it's really an opportunity for us to, um, to bless them and give them it. So here it's going to work. There's two organizations this year, um, Options for Women. Um, it's an opportunity for uh, ladies who find themselves perhaps pregnant. Uh, it's an opportunity for them to learn about adoption and other types of things. And then the other one is Vestia, and that is uh, the ones with the backpacks we helped out a little while ago. And that is an organization that primarily helps foster children and just to give them the, the, the support and so forth that they need. And both of these organizations kind of fit into this year's theme, which is <clears throat> that, that I think oftentimes we overlook the folks in the margins. We overlook the ones that, um, that actually if Jesus was walking on the streets, it would be the ones that he would walk to. Right, And so during the four-week series, is, uh, as we go into it, is really to look at some of the ones who are overlooked. And so this, uh, both of these organizations fit really well in it. And so my prayer is just really simple. At the end of four weeks, I want to pile up a whole bunch of cash for them and just bless them. And everything that you give in the little envelopes that says give, serve, love, I think it is in the seats, every bit of that goes to those organizations, all right? And so we're going to split it 50-50 to the two organizations. And you'll hear more about their uh, organizations in the next couple weeks. They'll have a table in the lobby, and there'll be some videos and stuff that will, will help you, all right? So, y'all ready? All right, so here's the great news for today. You, you've, heard the, you've heard people say, well, that's like preaching to the choir, right? You know, which is like, you know, you're preaching to people who are going to agree with you. So here's the cool thing about today's message. Today's message isn't for any of you, right? I mean, how cool is that? So you don't have to wear it. You don't have to apply it. You just have to simply listen to me for the next hour and a half, roughly. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> for the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And just make notes because this doesn't apply to you. And here's why. Because today we're going to talk about being good at being rich. And we already know that when you walked in, you said, I'm not rich, right? So look to your neighbor and just say, I'm not rich. This doesn't apply to me. <laughs> See? I knew it, right? And so you just have to imagine that if you knew someone who is rich, you would be able to tell them what they need to do to be good at it, all right? So you don't have to worry about any application, and this is not for you. Don't worry about it at all, all right? So because all of us are poor, and all of us are just laser-focused on Jesus, and he's it, period. So now we're going to talk about the ones who are rich and how easily they get distracted with other things in life. 
all right? So Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, writes to Timothy. Timothy is his understudy. Timothy's going to be a great leader in the New Testament church, and so he's studying under Paul. Paul is his, is his mentor. And so he writes him two letters, right, First and Second Timothy. And in one of the letters, First Timothy, that he writes to him, He tells them something interesting. He tells them something that would really fit well in our culture. Not, I mean, not amongst us, but in in other churches who have rich people. But but it would fit well, and it was 2,000 years ago. And Paul tells Timothy this. He says, listen, there's going to be a day where you're going to come across not unbelievers, okay? Believers, right? You're going to come across believers in Jesus Christ who are rich, And I want you to warn them because by default, by our own nature, even though we have Jesus in our heart, by our own nature, we are going to be in danger of drifting away and losing the priorities that Christ has in his life. And so he wants to warn them of this danger. Now, again, None of us need to worry about that because the first thing all of us do when we wake up in the morning is we have our quiet time, we read our Bible, right? We're witnessing to people who don't want it, right? You're all all in it, right? You're locked into Jesus, right? So, So here is for those of us who are poor, you just have to take notes. Don't worry about it. Number one in your outline, here is Paul's kind of concern about wealth. That if you ever win the lottery, okay, if you ever get an inheritance, if you ever get a promotion and you're making like big money, like 80,000 a year or something like that, if you ever get into that realm, then the danger is you might be rich and you might find yourself in this spot. So here it is, number one in your outline. Here's what wealth could cause us if we're not careful. Letter A is we will experience, or I should say the rich people, because none of us are rich, that they will experience a high level of discontentment. All right. Now, none of us know that because we have one pair of pants. We have a pair of pants that I wear to church. And then I got the other pair of pants that I wear when I'm doing yard work. Right. I got two pair of shoes. I got work shoes and I got my go to church shoes. Right. Ladies, you know what I'm saying. Right. I mean, you have two pair of shoes. You got the stuff that you wear uh, to work. And then you got when you're out shopping. Am I right? Right. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. And, And so we just have like just enough to get by. And so we don't have like closets full of stuff. And and so we don't really fit into this. But the wealthy people, the wealthy people, they will experience a high level of discontentment. So here's how I would describe it. Again, we don't have to worry about this, but you'll relate to this. If you feed an appetite, what happens to it? It grows, right? If you starve an appetite, it shrinks, right? And so here's the visual. You all know I have one sin in my life, and that is I love ice cream, right? That's it. That's the only sin that I've ever committed, all right? So you tell me if this is what rich people are like. So when I get a bowl for my ice cream, first of all, I read the label to find out what the serving size is supposed to be, right? I mean, because you need to know that. And so it says like one mini scoop. So I scoop, right, and, and I'm, they're mini scoops. And so I'm scooping, and I'm looking. Now, tell me, tell me if, this is, your, if you're, this is your struggle. I look in my bowl, and it's never enough. So what do I do? You put some more in, right? And so you add just a couple more scoops of ice cream, and, and then you look at it, and tell me, come on, help me out, some of you. Then you look at it, and you get your spoon and you go into the carton, <laughs> right? And you scoop it out because if it never hits the bowl, it doesn't count, right? And so you eat the, sco- you eat the scoop, <laughs> you eat the scoop of ice cream off, out on your spoon and it never counts, right? And that is the appetite for all of us. When we have something that we love, it's never, it never is enough. Now, some of you have been around for any length of time, you, you know this, um, because you made comments like this. You're like, man, I cannot believe how my garage is so full. It like, it multiplied, right? Like somehow, you know, the boxes 
are like finding lovers in there and they're like making boxes in there and all of a sudden you walk in you're like, whoa, how did that happen? Well, you turn the light off. That's how it happened. And all of a sudden everything multiplied. Now, ladies in your closet, no, forget it. That's not even, that's not even fair, right? You don't even, you don't have to worry about things in your closet, right? The ladies are always content with what they have, right, ladies? Now, not you, but I mean, you know, the, the rich people, because you only have one outfit. You have your Sunday outfit, and then you have your other outfit that you wear to work. That's all you have. And so you have, or rich people have, a high level of discontentment in your life. Now, you probably watch this on the rich and famous. They actually will take cars that are perfectly good, like, you know, say old models like 2018, right, and trade it in for 2019, right, the new car smell is still in there, but they want round headlights instead of square headlights, and so they'll take wealthy people, again, not us, because we, we just keep driving the same car that we have, and we, it turns into rust, and then we put wheels on the rust, and we keep driving that, but the, they'll, they'll actually take perfectly good 16, 18-foot boats, serious, and they'll go in and they'll want a 24-foot boat. Now, that other boat worked perfectly fine, but, but they just wanted something bigger and something better because they're wealthy, because they're not content with what they have. And so they, they upgrade, right? I mean, we all have flip phones. You all have flip phones still, right? Dial phones at your house, those of you who've been... A, been married for any length of time or had your own place. I mean, you still have all that stuff, right? You've not upgraded to any, you still have, you have rabbit ears on your phone, on your uh, television. It's a box. It has 12 channels. Excuse me. It only has 12 channels, right? I mean, that's what kind of TV you have. You have two through 13 and then you have UHF, whatever that means, right? And that's all you have. You've never upgraded to one of those cable channels or direct TV things that has like 400 gazillion channels, nothing worth watching. But anyway, you've never done that, right? Because see, we can't get our mind around what wealthy people do because all of us, we are so content with what we have. I mean, we're, we're just happy. We would never even imagine how we could possibly want to get something bigger or newer in our life. This is going to be interesting. How many of you were raised in the house that your folks lived in and still, if they're still living, still live there? Just, just kind of show your hand. L- look, look around. Do, do you know prior to 1960... That was not even heard of. Moving up, buying a starter home, and then buying something bigger, absolutely unheard of. You bought a house, you stayed there until you died. That's how it went, right? Now, we don't do that. I was actually raised in one house. My parents bought it in 62, I think, in Concord. And then when my dad passed away, about four years later, we had to move my mom over here, but that was the one house. But that's not true in my life right? In fact, we have what we call starter homes, right? And you buy a starter home, you're not going to stay there. And you know that going in as you're signing the papers, right? In our culture, that's just the mindset that you buy something, but it's only just to get your feet in the door to, burn, or to earn a little equity, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the mindset. Wealthy people have a high level of discontentment. Number B, a letter B in your outline and this is what feeds into it, is that we begin to believe the lie that if I had more, I would be content, okay? Now, now just kind of pause for a moment and think that through. So wealthy people are never content because there's an, always an appetite for more. And yet, running in the back of our mind, we believe that if I just had more, I would be content, Right? And that is the cycle of why our garages fill up, why our closets fill up, why, why, why we have all the stuff that we have is because we believe, we believe that if I just get more, I'll be content. And yet the reality is the more that we get, the more our appetite grows to want more stuff. So they did this study. 
and a couple financial institutes did this study. <clears throat> and they asked people who made 150,000 bucks a year, okay, if they are considered rich. And the answer was, what do you think it is? No. no, right? So what they did, brilliant. What they did is they went to people who made 30 to 38,000, I think it was, a year. And they asked them, if you made $75,000 a year, would you be rich? And they said, yes, they would be rich. So then they went to people who made $75,000 a year. And they asked them, if you made, made $150,000, so they, they're doubling it. If you made $150,000 a year, would you be rich? And guess what their answer was? Yes. Yes. Now, what's interesting about the study is, and I think it's brilliant, is that every group, if they doubled, they thought that was going to be it. And when they got there, they realized that isn't it. Right? 150 wasn't enough. Right? And so they're always wanting more. There's always this desire to want more in, in, in our life because there's a high level of discontentment, and then we believe the lie that if we just have more, we'd be content. So Paul writes 2,000 years ago, and he speaks, I think, the exact same advice that we need to hear today, 2,000 years later, and he's dealing with believers who are just like folks in 2018. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and uh, starting in verse 17, that's where we're going to hang out for most of the time. So here's what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, command those who are rich, the word command also means instruct, instruct those or command those who are rich in this present world. Okay, now, now just hit the pause button for a moment. Paul's concern is not about their wealth. My concern as a shepherd is not about your wealth. I don't care if you have a gazillion dollars. I don't care if your closet's completely full and you've got to build a second closet to put all your stuff in. I don't care if you have to go down the street and rent one of the storage units. It doesn't matter to me. But what matters to me is the next part, which is what Paul's most concerned about. And that is that what wealth will do to our spiritual life if we're not careful. Because at the end of the day, as the shepherd, right, money is amoral. Money, money is amoral. It's what you do with it is whether it's good or bad. And how much you have is really God's choice. But, but as Paul would write to Timothy, and I would speak to you guys, the bigger concern is about our spiritual life and how wealth affects us. So number two in your outline, <clears throat> here's, what, uh, here's the causes of it. Number two is wealth can cause us to digress spiritually. Okay, that, that it can cause us to kind of step back. Some of you want to say backslidden, that's an old school thing. But, but it's kind of going backward in your spiritual life. Now, no one wakes up and says, you know what? I got a raise, so here's the deal. I'm going to drift from Jesus, right? No one does that. But the reality is, the temptation is, and our default is, that we would do that in our life. And so Paul writes to him, and here's what he says. He says, instruct those who are rich in this present world, and then the next part of the verse is, not to be arrogant, okay? Now, now you just pause for a moment, and you think about this. So Paul is saying that there is this mindset that if your income goes up or you get a great job or you get, you get pay raises and so forth, that somehow that's directly connected to your IQ, okay? Now, have you ever watched sports players or movie stars or singers say some of the stupidest things known to mankind? You, you could, we could go into our preschool room and we would get more coherent answers than some of these people who, who go on on stage and they spew whatever the heck they're saying. And at the end of the day, you're like, what in the world? Where did they get that at? Because here's, here's the temptation. That if you're wealthy, you must be smart. And so Paul says you need, you need to warn them that in this present world that they are going to become arrogant. So he says warn them not to be arrogant. And arrogant means high thought or full of pride. That somehow because you're wealthy, you're special. 
right? You somehow, whatever, and you're just different than everyone else. And, and so he says the temptation is, is that you begin to think that you are it. Now, here, here's what Paul would say. Money is a gift that God gives you, okay? And if you turn it back to praise to him, it's all good. But if you look at it and go, man, I'm so smart. I'm such a great marketer. I'm such a great whatever I can, you know, create. Look at all the stuff that I created. You will be full of yourself. And Paul says what will end up happening is you will become full of yourself. You're going to be high-minded or you're going to be full of yourself. And he goes on and he says, do not be arrogant and do not put, uh, nor do, uh, nor to put their hope in wealth. And then here's the warning about it. Because it's so uncertain, right? That you put all your eggs in the basket and that somehow you just look at your checkbook and you go, you know what? I'm absolutely secure. I'm absolutely, I got everything. It's all good. There is no way anything could ever happen to me. The problem is, is stock markets go up and stock markets go down, don't they? Jobs come and jobs go, don't they? Right? Housing market, 2008, hello, go up, and what happens? They go down, right? Sure, so things happen. And so when we do all that, and we put all of our focus into our wealth, then all of a sudden our hope begins to drift away from the one who gave it to us, and we start putting it into our 401k, we put it into our retirement fund, we put it into how smart I am, what a great company I own or a company I run. We start putting it in all those other things, all right? Now, here's what in the Old Testament it says about that. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 11, it says this, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, all right? What does that mean? Well, in those days, they had enemy armies that would just randomly attack other people, right? I mean, they just would get an idea, and then off their army would go. And so communities or states, countries, would build a wall. They would fortify their place. They would have, in many cases, they would have one entrance into the whole city. And in that entrance would be military people, and then they would build high walls. In many cases, they would have uh, rivers or lakes around it to prevent people from, you know, just running and, and scaling the wall. That was their way of trying to protect it, okay? So the proverb, sa- proverb writer says this, that the people who are wealthy are the same ones who think that because they have this secure location, that they are absolutely safe and secure, that there's no way anything could happen. I mean, after all, we have a military, we have barriers, we have moats, we have all these different things. There is no way that it's possible it can get in. And he goes on and he says, they, what's the word? They, they what? They imagine that it is unscalable, right? In other words, that somehow there is no way anything could ever happen. So here's what Paul says. He says that when you put your hope in your finances, you may get to a place financially where you're like, there is no way anything could ever happen to me. I'm not making light of this, okay? There was a guy who invented Apple phone. What's his name? Yeah, one of the richest men at that time in the world. And when his heart stopped, what was he? And all of his money helped how? Didn't. Right? And what's interesting is, we know that. We know that. As we sit here doing, we know that. And yet, the deception is, is that we think because we have it, we're safe. And yet the reality is, you're never safe. Right? In fact, you're only safe when you run into Jesus right, and hide your life in him, you accept him as your Lord and Savior, right? One of the new things today, and I don't know if you've known, that the the super wealthy now are doing uh, parts of their DNA in freezing things. They've done it in the past, but now they think they figured it out, that somehow they're going to take some DNA samples, and at some future date, they're going to be able to resurrect a person from living, right? So they pay thousands of dollars to these companies to freeze parts of their DNA and all this other stuff. And, and I, I'm watching, this is true. This is, I was, I was watching this the other night. In my mind, I'm thinking, I got a simple solution. Just invite Jesus in your life. When you check out of here, you'll be with him. 
you don't have to come back to this place. Right? And it costs nothing except giving your life to them. So let me ask you a question. And I know the answer before I ask. How much money would you need to secure your future against everything that you could possibly imagine would ever happen? How much would it be? Now, the answer is twofold. The answer is, depends on what season you're in, in life. And the answer is, always more than what you currently have. Right? Now, think about this. Let's say you're in college and you get married. Your thought back then is, or, you know, thought is, if we could just get our own, like, studio apartment, and we could get a couple boxes for end tables, we'll sleep on the floor, and if our car sometimes starts, oh, life will be good, right? And so you think that's all you need. And so you strive for it, and so you get into that studio apartment, you got a couple orange crates for end tables, you're sleeping on a futon, your car sometimes starts, sometimes it doesn't, but for the most part it does, and you think, ah, that's great, if we could just get a one-bedroom apartment, right? And we get a one-bedroom apartment, and we go, you know what, it'd be nice if we had a little space. It'd be great if we had two bedrooms, right? And we could actually get like some actual coffee tables, not orange crates. And then we get the coffee tables, and we get a two-bedroom. And we think, you know what? (laughs) I mean, I would take just like a three-bedroom house, like 800 square feet, right? And then you get the 800 square feet. You don't even want a garage at that time. You just take a shed. And then you want a uh, attached shed. And then you want a two-car garage and then you want a three-car garage and then you need a five-car garage and then you need an eight-story house and then you need 16 67 bedrooms for your one kid and you need all that stuff right and here's the funny thing every season of life what you need for your future is always more and then here's what's interesting when you get into your golden years of life it's not stuff that you fear it's health that you fear Right? All of a sudden you're wondering, well, what if something happened and they had to be put into you know, a convalescent care or whatever the case? How's, how's our assets going to be? How are we going to be able to handle that? Right? And it's never enough. Whether you're starting out or whether you're in your golden years and you're looking at retirement or you're, you are in retirement, it's never enough. And that's the truth of it. Because when you put your hope in wealth, it's never enough. You will always play that what if, well, what if, well, what if thing, right? And it's never enough, and so you're always pressing. And so uh, Paul tells Timothy this. He says, but put their hope in what? Put their hope in what? All right? So he encourages them to put their hope in God because he recognizes that the natural drift is to begin to turn away, and he wants to encourage in this. And, and so Jesus would say it this way. And what's interesting about this, and you know this because you've heard people say it, that when Jesus, uh, in the life of Jesus, is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? That's the Gospels. That's the story of Christ. And in that, he talked more about money than he talked about heaven and hell, which is kind of a weird thing because God sent him so that those who accepted him as Lord and Savior would spend all all eternity in heaven and those who reject Jesus would spend all eternity in hell and yet he spoke about money more than heaven and hell combined right why is that because here's a simple thing Jesus knows that your heart is directly connected to the things that you value the most all right now Jesus uses a term here in Matthew chapter 6 he says for where your treasures is and you go well I don't have like a treasures box with you know cash and gold and whatever in my house we don't live that way but in those days that's what it would be you would store all your wealth in some type of box and you would hide it and Jesus just said if I walked into the room and I wanted to know where your heart was at Jesus would say I would just look for your box because that's where it's at because that's what you have most interest in. In our life, he would simply say this, what do you value the most? When you look at your life and you think through it, what is it that you value the most? And so Jesus would say it this way. He says, for whatever you value the most, there your heart will be. And what does Jesus want in our life? Our heart, right? Not our stuff. He wants our heart. 
right? And he says, if I'm looking for it, that's where I'm going to find it. Verse 24 goes on and he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and you'll uh, hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and you will despise the other. Now look at the last part of the verse. You, what's the next word? Cannot. cannot. You might try, but you cannot serve both God and money. Now, money isn't evil, and God isn't opposed to it. In fact, when we look at it as from a believer's standpoint, we believe what he has given us is from him. Now, here's what we all know. And again, I told you this message isn't for any of us because we're we're all, we got this locked in. In my years in ministry, I've had, I think, five, I said five or six in the first service, uh, opportunities where families have had loved ones who are passing, all right? And so maybe they've removed the life support and so forth. They didn't want to stay in there, but they wanted someone to stay in there with their loved one. And so they've asked me to do it. And I've done it. I did it for my mom and my dad, which is additional too, right? And here's what I learned. None of them ever put their hand up and said, would you please get me my bank book Let's talk about how much dough I have. None of them has ever done that. If they're coherent, and some of them have been, we've been able to talk about the Lord, their walk with God, the faithfulness of God, how he met them in their time of need, the things that he has provided for them, how they look forward to heaven. They never stopped and said, bring out the Bank of America book, man. Let me show you how fat it is, right? And we know that, don't we? Because at the end, if we're fortunate enough, some people don't have that opportunity to really sit back and ponder. But if we have that opportunity to sit back and ponder life, we will 110% of the time talk about the faithfulness of God and the word of God in our life. And so here's Paul's thing to the wealthy people, and it's my thing to you. Why would you spend a minute of your current life focusing on things that at the end of your life you're going to care less about? Why would you do that? Why would you put all your hope and all your, uh, uh, all your focus on your finances And yet we know at the end, whenever that may be, that you're going to talk about and you're going to focus on and you're going to look forward to spending all eternity with Christ. And Paul, remember, he's talking to believers, not unbelievers. And he said, why why would you spend all that time doing that? In your outline, wealth is our biggest competitor for our heart, right? Right? Wealth is our biggest competitor for our heart. When you wake up in the morning, you don't go, do I worship Satan today or Jesus? Not really sure, right? I mean, you don't think Christmas or Halloween, right? That that just isn't where we're at. And yet, Scripture says that wealth is our biggest competitor, and here's why. Because wealth promises, it doesn't deliver, but it promises what only God can give. Peace and security, Right? And yet we think that if we get it, we'll have peace and security, and yet it's never enough. It's never enough, and we're constantly striving. Look what Proverbs writer says. Keep falsehoods and lies far from me. We're all in favor of that, right? Right? All right. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Hmm. But give me only my, what is it? Now, why would you do that, writer of Proverbs? Verse 9, otherwise I may have too much. Well, what would you do if you had too much? And I would disown you and say, who is the Lord? Isn't it cool how you ask questions into Scripture of where they're going with it? Right? He's saying, he's saying if you have too much, all of a sudden there's a possibility that you forget about it. Now, again, none of us do, right? None of us, do, do, none of us have more than we literally, if we walked into your refrigerator today, you only have food for today, right? Right? No. Come on. How many got refrigerators in the garage? How, how many got two refrigerators in the garage? 
I know, I got one of those compact freeze fr- refrigerators in the house, right? Yeah, exactly. H- how many of you, how many of you do this? Now, ladies don't, but men, go ahead and rat your wife's out, all right? How many of you stand in front of a perfectly huge closet that literally you would need the jaws of life to separate in order to get to the coat hanger? Come on, right? And you look there and you say something because you heard it on TV. None of us have ever said it, or our wives have certainly never said it. And you look at it and you say, it's Sunday, I got to go to church, but I don't have This is true. So uh, where Tammy and I live, um, we bought the house that the farmer owned. And so all the house, all the land around it has been subdivided and they're building houses. It's on, it's on Rose Avenue out uh, on Laurel, right? So come on by, don't knock on my door. If I like you, you come in the garage. You don't come to my front door, all right? That's the rule, how we roll. So anyhow, so Tammy and I get nosy and we want to go up the street to see what the houses look like, right? And so we're, we, we, we drive down there because it's a long way, it's like, from that wall to that wall. So anyhow, so we drive down there, and so we're walking up this one house. It's a two-story thing, and I walk up into it, and, and then it's like the master bedroom, beautiful master bedroom, and I turn into the closet, and it was about roughly about this wide, right? And I thought, because I knew where I was going with this message, and I thought, my Lord, is that, can you say Lord in church? I'm not sure. My Lord, How could anyone ever fill this thing up? I mean, you could have a family of 28 living in that thing. That's how big it is, right? But the truth is that it will fill up. You want to know why? Because the appetite for more will always grow. It will never shrink. And we will stand in front, and we will separate it, and we will say, if we can, and we will say, is it possible that there's anything worth wearing? And the answer is, well, of course not, there isn't, right? And yet, we all live in that world. Y'all with me on that? Yes. <clears throat> Verse 17 it goes on and it says this. Hey, Eric, click the air on. It goes on and it says this. <clears throat> but put their hope in what? God. God, who richly provides us everything for our what? Enjoyment. Enjoyment. Right? So here's the cool thing. If you have a, a, a closet about the size of this room, which is around 3,600 square feet, God bless you. Fill it up. Right? You, you could buy 600 gazillion shoes, ladies. It's fine. Not my wife, but you're fine to do that. Right? <laughs> So you, you can fill up your garage, you can fill up your bag, you can fill up everything you want, and it is A-OK. It is all from God, recognize that, and it is all for your enjoyment, not your worship. All right? Big difference, isn't it? If you want to buy a 24-foot boat because your 16-foot boat doesn't do it, God bless you, go buy it. Right? If you want to trade in that old car, that 2018 car, I mean, and you want to get something new and current, then by all means do it. Right? And so he gives it to us for our enjoyment, but the connection is our hope is still in Christ. Right? That our hope hasn't moved from it. Letter B. Wealthy Christ followers can get distracted from God's principles, right? And this is, um, this is the world in which we live in. And I think out of all the things that are taking place in churches across America today, the thing that concerns me the most is this, all right? And you've heard me say that the average church attender in today's world in, in, in America, whether it's the Bible Belt or California, it's, it's the same, all right? is about 1.2, 1.3 times a month. That's it. So they've done all these studies to try to figure out what it is. And they've gone out and they've asked the people, do you like your pastor? Do you like your church? Do you like the sound? Do you like the air conditioning? Do you like the carpet? Right, all the questions. And the answer is yes, 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 yes. Do you have any problems with Jesus? Nope, I love Jesus. So what they're finding is the number one thing that causes folks not to attend is the wealth that they have that gives them the opportunities to go elsewhere, okay? In the old days, right, like 1950, 
you went to church on Sunday, and you stayed there all day. In fact, that was church, you had a church potluck, right? And then you had evening service and training union of some sort, and then everyone hung out, and they had ice cream. That's why I became a Christian. And, um, and then y'all went home. In fact, your entertainment was church. That was it, right? And, and I'm not saying that, that, it, that, you know, going to the theme park and having a boat and having a motor home and going here and having a house in the, in the mountains. And the, I'm not saying any of that is bad. I'm just simply saying this, that what we have to be cautious of is that wealth causes us to digress spiritually. And then all of a sudden, we begin to lose sight of what really the priorities of Christ is all about. And that is, in my opinion, in the current church life in America today, I think that is the biggest concern that pastors ought to have. And that is, we are, as pastors, we are called to build disciples. How do you do that when you have them 1.3 times a month, right? The thing that Eric talked about, the, the app devices, you know what those, why those are being created? Because people attend 1.3 times a month. And so it's given the church opportunities to try to go into that world where they're at to give them what otherwise they would have had on a Sunday morning, right? And that's true with the children's ministry and every other area. And I, and I think I say that not to beat you guys up or not to browbeat you. Hey, I have a motor home or a trailer. I go on vacations. I love, I love going out and spending time away. And all that stuff is a-okay. I got a massive garage. If you ever come to my house, it is a massive garage. It's not full of anything, uh, any stuff, but I have kids who have things in there and so forth. But, but it, the thing is, is that we just need to step back and recognize that what wealth will do. Because the reality is this. We are wealthy. We are the people that I joked about at the very beginning. And I said, it's not about, it's not us, it's the rich people. In fact, in, in your outline, Paul goes on and he says in verse 18, he says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In verse 19, it says this, in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of, what is the word? Of the, that is truly, you want to know the purpose of life? You want to know the meaning of life? It's simple. Do good, do good deeds, right? And that doesn't mean we're saved that way. Be generous and be willing to share. And focus on the priorities of Christ. And when you do, you will live life. And you won't be focused with the stuff that God blesses you with for our convenience. And we won't worship it. Here's the funny part. God has given us, or God has blessed us with more than we need. And the definition of that is we are rich. If you have more than what you currently need right now, by definition, you are rich. If you make $34,000, you'll hear politicians on both sides talk about the one percenters, fleece the one percenters, tax them all, right? Look at the evil one percenters. Well, if you make $34,000 a year, according to uh, globally, you are the one percenters. Yikes. If you make $80,000 a year, you are the point one percenters. Now, I know the answer. I write the message. I already know what you guys are thinking. But Pastor Dan, this is California. This is the Bay Area. Starter homes are 600 grand and blah, 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 blah. I get all that. I just want to throw it out there because the temptation is to say, man, this message doesn't apply to me. And the truth is, is if you make $34,000 a year, you make $80,000 a year, and you have more than what you need, you are rich. And so Paul's admonishment to the church was this. Be good at it. If God is going to bless you with stuff, be good at it. Be good at being rich in your life. And so the take home, and we'll wrap up. The take home is this. We need to understand that we have a greater responsibility to unleash love, mercy, and our resources for his kingdom. Because the truth is, the truth is, and all of us can be in different seasons of life. But the truth is, we are rich. 
right? And the temptation is, the temptation and what the series does is to try to help us to recalibrate, to make sure that we're focusing in on the priorities that Christ has as he unleashes his love to the people who are in the margins, who are the people who, are, who people walk past, right? The ones in the sidelines, the ones that the crowds would walk by, but they would scream, Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus would leave the big group to go over to the ones in the margins, the ones that the world would step by. That was the priority of Christ. And we need to make sure that we come back, recalibrate ourselves, right? We are blessed. We have great communities and great homes and great cars. God bless you. That's awesome. But is our heart for the priorities of Christ? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity just to kind of pause and take a step back. And Lord, my prayer is, my prayer is, has been through this series for a month or so, Lord, that each of us would recognize that what we have is simply a gift from you and that we need to pause and we need to be grateful for what you have given us and we need to turn it back to praise to you. Father, help us to put our hope and our trust and our faith completely in you. You've given us things for our enjoyment and our comfort, but not to worship. Lord, help us to recognize that in our life, that we would keep you first in every area with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ and I wanna give you that opportunity to do that. And each week, um, I just talk about the little ABCs. It's just kind of a way to track it. A is admit that we're sinners. Each of us uh, are sinners. We have missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And if your desire today is to invite Jesus into your life, just silently pray this prayer as I say it. Just repeat after me silently. You say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I am a sinner, that I have missed the mark. And I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And today I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Now here's what I want to do. You're going to look to your neighbor, right? And you're going to say, I am rich, all right? So go ahead and say it. Now they're not going to borrow any money from you, so you can say it like you mean it. Turn to your neighbor. I, I, I haven't heard any of you. All right. Now, if they ask you for any money on the way out, tell them no. Go see Pastor Dan. He's, he, he's richer than all of us, all right? So, hey, uh, Pastor Eric's going to close the service out. Next week, we're going to talk about unleashing love, and we're going to really begin to look into the folks who get marginalized in our society and what we can do to help out. God bless you. See you on the way out.